Hello, this is week three of class, week three of lecture. Uh, just in case you didn't see, we will be online a little longer than planned. We've added an extra month to online instruction. Um, keep an eye out, it may go longer than that, just depends on what happens, so just a quick update on that. Uh, for today, we're talking about the Renaissance, the scientific re revolution, and religious warfare. There's quite a few things. I'll be quick as I can, but it might be a little longer than last week. So let's first talk about the Renaissance. Um, it's hard to say exactly when the Renaissance begins. Generally speaking, you could put it 1300 to 1600, give or take a little bit. The Renaissance kind of happens at the same time as the Reformation and the Scientific Revolution, which is why this is all together here. A couple things about the Renaissance. Um, first of all, it begins in Italy, mostly because Italy had a lot of money at the time. Plus, Italy was still a bunch of independent city-states, very urban, so it was very easy for ideas and information to flow in Italy. And there are a couple of things about the Renaissance to uh, that are like they're the hallmarks, the key points. Number one, there's this extreme hostility to the culture of the Middle Ages. And there's a fascination with the ancient world. There's a rise of interest between the Greeks and the Romans. They don't care quite as much about religious society. They want to expand beyond that. And one of the ways they do this is with the idea of humanism. The Renaissance is this idea of exploring what makes mankind mankind. So there's consumerism. There's this idea of quantification. The idea of a timeless society goes away, and there's this philosophy called humanism. The easiest way to describe humanism without being face-to-face -face with you in a classroom is just what makes man man. Um, the humanists, they're still Christian. They still believe in Christian beliefs. It's just they want to focus more on people. It's not enough just to be alive. In, the, in humanism, to be a person, you need to be educated as well. Now, there are lots of thinkers in the school of humanism, but there's two of them that I really want you to know about. One is Erasmus, who was a philosopher, a teacher, and a religious figure. And then there's also Machiavelli, who was like, the personal advice giver of several princes in Italy. Now Erasmus, he's mostly associated with, with what's known as the Northern Renaissance. Uh, he lived in Northern Europe. He was actually uh, Dutch. And he was well known for trying to blend humanism and the Greek world, the Roman world, and science all together with the traditional Christian love, hope, and faith. And he wanted to go back to the simplicity of the early church. He wanted to go back to the purity of the, of the early church. And Erasmus really wanted to uh, kind of reform the church in some ways. And he published editions of the New Testament from the original Greek and the Latin, found some differences in the, the writing and the translations and tried to correct some of that. Uh, Machiavelli, he is associated with the Southern or Italian Renaissance. And he was from the city of Florence and in his book, The Prince, it's full of advice. There's murder in it, there's betrayal. Uh, he's basically gonna tell people what you have to do to stay in power. He, he says, be kind to your people, but don't be afraid to cut them down if they get out of line. 
And believe it or not, Machiavelli actually thought he was the best example of what Aristotle from ancient Greece said was the perfect person. Uh, Machiavelli said, I have the strength Aristotle was looking for, the valor and the virtue. Renaissance art, probably what you think of with the Renaissance. You've got your Ninja Turtles, Donatello, Raphael, Michelangelo, Leonardo. Um, but it's more than that. Um, a lot of the artists in the Renaissance, they wanted personal recognition. Uh, at the bottom right corner, that is Michael Michelangelo's Pieta. And when the Pieta was sculpted, everybody thought Raphael did it. And Michelangelo was so mad, he wanted the recognition that in the middle of the night, he broke into the church where it was held, and he carved his name into the Mother Mary's outfit so everybody knew that he did it. There was also this desire for less church influence and this idea for real-world depictions of people. Um, Renaissance artists would paint a person warts and all. Uh, Renaissance people, uh, Renaissance authors, I should say, invented the idea of the autobiography. They wanted real-world attention. Uh, Michelangelo, once again, uh, he's probably the most famous of these artists other than maybe Leonardo da Vinci. Michelangelo was so worried about showing people the way they should be that he would pay grave robbers to dig up people so that Michelangelo could dissect them and draw them accurately. There's this reimagining, this rebirth, if you will, of ancient Greek and ancient Roman texts, ancient Greek and ancient Roman statues and architecture and ideas. And then there's this artist named Albrecht Dürer, it's D-U-R-E-R. -E he comes up with this new way of painting and drawing called perspective. Now, even if you have no idea who Ar Albrecht Dürer is, and even if you have no idea what perspective is, you've been doing it your whole life. The idea of perspective when it comes to art is taking a two-dimensional object and painting it or drawing it to look three-dimensional. Music even <clears throat> was a throwback to ancient Greek and ancient Roman times. Now, while no actual Greek or Roman music existed or made it to the Renaissance, Renaissance artists and musicians had ideas and they tried to set music to church hymns, masses, and madrigals, which is a spoken text without any sound. So what the the uh, musical artists would do is they would take written word and they would write the music so it sounded like spoken word and then they would play that. If you're curious, by the way, what the bottom left corner is, that is Peter Bruegel's Slaughter of the Innocents. And this is another one of those, those uh, paintings that has kind of a dual meaning. Um, it's supposed to look like any picture, but what it really is, is Spanish soldiers burning down a town in Belgium, or as it was known in the, at the time, Flanders. Now we have the scientific revolution going on at the same time. This is like a big period of change. And that gentleman right there is Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, Isaac Newton did not really sit underneath an apple tree and have an apple hit him in the head. That's just uh, a fantasy or fairy tale, if you will. But Isaac Newton is still an amazing person. Now what happens in the scientific revolution? Well, Early scholars, they're not just going back and looking at Greek texts and Latin texts for Renaissance purposes. They're looking at texts for mathematical and astronomical and scientific purposes as well. So we end up with um, people like Copernicus, uh, Nicholas Copernicus. He's going to observe the world and he's going to come up with this theory 
that the Earth is an orbiting body around the sun, just like anything else that he can visualize in the sky. So, in other words, the the Earth is no different than Mars, Jupiter, or anything else. It's just, it's there. It happens. This becomes known as the theory of Copernican heliocentrism. I know that's a, a mouthful, but what this is going to do, it's going to give way to Galileo. Galileo is going to have one of the earliest telescopes. He's going to observe the stars, and he's going to say, you know what? Copernicus was right. The Earth goes around the sun. The Earth is not the center of the world or the universe. And he's going to start publishing academic and scientific papers on this. Now, the end result is Galileo, who was a very devout Catholic, is going to be reprimanded by the Catholic Church. Uh, the Pope is going to call Galileo to Rome, and the Pope is going to order Galileo to admit that all of his publications, all of his research, all of his findings were false. And not only that, did Galileo have to recant his entire life's work, he was kept as a prisoner in his home. He was under house arrest until the rest of his life. Now, Isaac Newton, um, he develops calculus along with a guy named Lipnitz. Uh, they invent calculus independently of each other. But Isaac Newton's version of calculus is the one that exists and persists. And the idea behind calculus is to give scientists a way to use formulas to explain planetary motion and higher order physics. Uh, eventually, Isaac Newton is going to develop Newtonian physics, uh, and Newtonian physics is going to become the basis of modern day physics, modern day astronomy, and modern day science. Not to mention Isaac Newton, he's going to write one of the most influential, one of the most important books of all time, the, the Principia Mathematica, or the Principle of Mathematics. The scientific revolution has a lot of new discoveries, a lot of inventions. There's the barometer to measure atmospheric pressure. That gives way to the earliest weather forecasts. Telescopes so you can see far away. Microscopes so you can see small, small, small items and microbes. Thermometer to do temperature. Uh, there's new scientific academies that are created. There's the Royal Society of London. I think that's created in 1666. The Paris Academy of Sciences. Both of those are going to be groups of scientists that push science findings and science fact. Uh, coffee shops, of all things, become important because coffee shops are going to be places where all these academics meet discuss their ideas, share their ideas, and give each other guest lectures. And then you also have this new form of philosophy invented by Rene Descartes. If you're a fan of geometry, uh, he is important in geometry, but beyond that, he's also a philosopher. Uh, Rene Descartes, he's the one that comes up with the idea of, I think, therefore I am. He's the one that says, you know what? To be truly human, we need to be educated, and we need to separate what we think world is from what we observe reality to be. Now, we have a quick reformation on a ref refresher on the Reformation. Um, if you have had the first half of world history, that's kind of where we end is the Reformation. But if you haven't had it, um, the important stuff that you really need to know about the Reformation is this. Uh, first of all, the Reformation, it didn't just come out of nowhere. The Reformation had been something that had been brewing in the background for hundreds of years. Um, Martin Luther, who lives in the early 1500s, late 1400s, is not the, the creator of the Reformation. He's actually kind of towards the end. There are people involved in the Reformation in England as early as 1330, a guy named John Wycliffe from England says, you know what, 
I don't find anywhere in the Christian Bible where the cult of Mary should be a thing. I don't see anywhere in the Christian Bible where it says people, sh uh, the churches should own property. Then there's going to be another guy named John Huss who says, I don't see anywhere that the church should own property. I don't see anywhere that says the Pope should have all the power. And then eventually you're going to get to Martin Luther who's going to say, look, there's a couple problems with Christianity. Number one, clerical ignorance. The people in the church don't know what they're doing, and that's because they were never properly trained. Um, he's also going to say that there is clerical immorality. Uh, in the Catholic Church, priests aren't supposed to be married, priests aren't supposed to have sex, and priests definitely aren't supposed to have kids. Yet, that was happening. There was also the idea of clerical pluralism. I know clerical pluralism, you're probably like, what the heck is that? It's real simple. Some priests had multiple churches, even if they never visited the other churches. They were just pocketing the money like they were running the church. The biggest issue, though, and the one that really sets off Martin Luther, is the idea of an indulgence. Uh, an indulgence, if you ever played Monopoly, you're familiar with the get-out-of-jail cards. An indulgence is kind of like a get-out-of-hell card. You could buy forgiveness instead of asking for forgiveness. And Martin Luther says, this isn't cool. You could buy forgiveness for something you have not done. You could buy forgiveness for something that you're truly not sorry about. You could even buy forgiveness for a dead relative. And Mar Martin Luther says, what is this? You can't do this. You have to repent. You have to be sorry. Well, things get to a boiling point. And on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther is going to post a document called the 95 Theses on the door of the Wittenberg Castle Church. And it's basically going to be a laundry list of items, a list of 95 things that Martin Luther says need to be changed, or that the Pope is doing wrong, or that need to be fixed. It doesn't go over very well. The Pope asks for Martin Luther to be arrested, but Martin Luther is actually protected by a friend of his, and eventually... Martin Luther's ideas are going to develop into something new. Probably the biggest thing to come out of Martin Luther's ideas is the idea of salvation by faith of alone. Martin Luther believed that all you have to do is believe in the, the Christian God. And if you do that, then you will receive salvation. That was different from traditional Catholic teaching in that there were certain works, certain steps you had to take in addition to just believing. This is going to manifest and become the basis of today's Lutheran Church. There is a Catholic counter-reformation a lot of people don't know about and don't talk about, where at the Council of Trent members of the Catholic Church are going to meet together and take a look at what Martin Luther complained about. <clears throat> and they're basically going to say, we're, we're right. The Catholic Church is right. Yes, you need salvation, but you also need works. The cult of Mary is a thing. The Pope is always right. And all these other problems Martin Luther says you need to fix, the Catholic Church says no. The only thing the Catholic Church really do is they create two new orders of nuns. Uh, one order of nuns is called the Ursuline nuns. If you've never heard of them, uh, they, the Ursuline nuns were meant to, tr to train young women how to be good Catholic mothers. And then there's also the Carmelite nuns who were taught to go into impoverished poor areas and teach Catholicism to poor people. You also have the Society of Jesus known as the Jesuits, and I like to consider them the stormtroopers of the Pope. Whenever the Pope needed somebody to be, to be converted to Catholicism, whether it was voluntarily or not, 
the Pope would send the Jesuits to that place to forcibly convert people. There was a way to gain back population after half of Europe became Protestant. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> As you can probably guess, there are a ton of wars of religion based off of the, the Protestant Reformation. And I just have a couple of them listed here. Uh, I couldn't go over all of them, possibly. Uh, one of the bigger ones is the French Civil War from 1572 to 1598. There have been many French revolutions. Uh, this is one of the, the earliest ones based on religion. You had Catholics versus Huguenots. A Huguenot is basically a French Calvinist or a French Presbyterian. And there's a long story behind this. I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible. But once upon a time, France was not a united kingdom. There were different parts of France who had different kings. And in 1572, King Henry III of Navarre, who was a Catholic, married Margaret of Valois, who was a Protestant. And many of the Catholic French citizens had a problem of this. Now to be even more complicated, Margaret of Valois was the brother, the sister of King Charles the ninth of France. Their mother was Catherine de Medici. He was one of the the Pope's uh, bankers. So this is like a real big power grab based around religion. Well, the day after Henry and Margaret marry, Margaret's other brother, Henry of Valois, along with help from their mother, Catherine de Medici, organized this mass assassination and this massacre of French Huguenots or French Protestants. Uh, it's so big that it gets a special name. It's known as the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. And because of this mass killing of Huguenots the day after Margaret and Henry III are married, a, a civil war breaks out. The civil war doesn't end until 1598 when the Edict of Nantes is issued, and the Edict of Nantes guaranteed freedom of religion to the French Huguenots. Now, it's not all good news because the Edict of Nantes is going to be revoked in 1685, and it then became illegal again in 1685 to be a Protestant. Another war is the Dutch War of Independence. It goes from 1565 to 1609. Uh, last week I talked about the, the Habsburgs and how the Habsburg dynasty got separated into two parts. Well, King Philip, if you remember, became the king of Portugal, Spain, and the Americas. Well, part of his empire included what is today Holland or the Netherlands. Well, the Netherlands, or, or Holland, or the Dutch, whatever you want to call them, were Protestant. But Philip, being a Catholic, demanded that the Dutch convert to Catholicism. And when they refused to convert to Catholicism, he sent soldiers to kill the Dutch. Eventually, multiple provinces of the Dutch, or the Netherlands, get together. They declare themselves an independent country and form the Netherlands. Fighting goes on until 1609. Another war starts that the Spanish get involved in and the Dutch don't truly get their independence until 1648, even though the fighting stops in 1609. Then we have the English Civil War, which is a whole class in itself that I don't have time for. Um, but if you ever go to a four-year school, I highly recommend you take a class on the English Civil War if you see one offered. Um, it's about 100 years after Henry VIII. If you know the story of Henry VIII, Henry VIII wanted a boy. He couldn't have a boy, so he left the Catholic Church, divorced his wife, and then went on a murdering spree whenever a woman didn't produce a male heir. Well, by the time we get into the 1630s and 1640s, a monarch has come back to power who is Catholic. He's not openly Catholic, but he's secretly Catholic and everybody knows the secret. In fact, <clears throat> King James I
starts to restore Catholic weddings and Catholic services. And on top of that, these monarchs are trying to take total control of the government as well. Well, Parliament protests the Catholic monarchs. Parliament starts passing laws preventing Catholics from holding office and holding power. And the Catholic monarchs completely just ignore that. By the time we get to King James I, Parliament is fed up and they've had it. And Parliament declares war on King James I. Battles break out. And by 1651, King James is defeated by Oliver Cromwell. King James is arrested. King James is accused of breaking the law, even though he was the king and made the law. And he's beheaded. He's killed. Oliver Cromwell, who was the leader of Parliament, then declares himself a dictator and runs the government for the next 10 years. Oliver Cromwell is such a bad leader that when he dies, the English Parliament begs the son of James I to come back and be king. They say, sorry about what we did for your dad. Will you please come back and help us? We, we screwed up. We're sorry. And James I becomes the king of England, and you can see him there sitting on his royal throne, looking probably the most kingly of kings. Now, the biggest religious war is going to be the Thirty Years' War that actually lasts 30 years. This one is complicated, so once again, I'm going to be as short as I possibly can. Um... Europe is basically split into two parts. Southern Europe stays Catholic, Northern Europe stays Protestant. And right around 1618, there are four Catholic representatives of Ferdinand II who go to the city of Prague, which was in Bohemia, today part of the Czech Republic. And they ask and demand that the Bohemians convert to Catholicism because their king, Ferdinand II, requires it. Well, the leaders of the Protestant government meet, and they decide, no thank you, we want to stay Protestant. And they throw the Catholic representatives out of a fourth-story window. Yes, that's right. People are thrown out of a window. This is known as defenestration, which is one of the coolest words ever. If you want to get mad at somebody, throw them out a window and tell them they've been defenestrated. Well, the four guys, they didn't die. They actually landed on some hay bales that were underneath, but a revolt starts. Uh, Ferdinand II brings his army in. The Bohemians resist. The revolt is put down, but not before King Gustavus II Adolphus of Sweden comes in and saves the day. Now you probably think to yourself, the Swedish, what? Aren't they the ones that gave us Ikea and furniture we have to put together? Yes, they did. But at one point in time, believe it or not, Sweden was the most powerful country in Europe. Well, Sweden, with the help of the Bohemians that are left and, and Denmark, they're going to fight to a draw against the Habsburgs, the Eastern and the Western Habsburgs come together to fight Sweden. They end up fighting to a draw. And before you know it, France is going to enter the war on the side of the Protestants. That's a surprise because France was a Catholic country. Now, why did France do this? Because they were looking big picture. They were looking at political victory not religious victory. So in 1648, France wins the Thirty Years' War for the Protestants, even though it was a Catholic country. Now the end result, and I know I didn't put it into the, the PowerPoint here because you can read it in the book, is something called the Treaty of Westphalia. Uh, in the Treaty of Westphalia, or the Peace of Westphalia, it was decided that every individual kingdom in the Holy Roman Empire, every individual country in Europe could choose for themselves. Are they Catholic 
or are they Protestant? And I also have to talk about absolutism. Absolutism is an idea that's going to develop after these wars of religion that are loosely based in, in the idea of religion. And that's because of the divine rights of king. Uh, there was this belief that the crown, the, the king of France was chosen by God. And therefore, he had the divine right to rule. Now, you're going to see absolutism in Russia and Prussia, which will eventually become Germany, but it's best seen in France. Now, what are the, the hallmarks? What are the traits of an absolute monarchy? Well, there's one ruler associated with the entire country. The ruler is in many ways bigger than the country. There's no national assemblies, there's no House of Lords, no House of Commons, nothing like that. The kings have control of the nobles, tell the nobility what to do. The king appoints government officials. In fact, in France, the king of France would sell government offices in exchange for money. Russia, Prussia, and France also had huge armies and secret police as well. Now, French absolutism is absolutely crazy. Um, France was divided up into classes or estates. There's the first estate, second estate, and third estate. We'll talk more about them when we get to the French Revolution. But of the third estate, third estate, I should say, 95% of the population was the third estate. That's the peasants in the middle class. And they had absolutely no power underneath the absolute monarchy of King Louis XIV. Russia, if you're curious, it becomes an absolute monarch underneath Peter the Great. Uh, Peter the Great is going to reorganize the military and put it directly under his control. Peter the Great is going to require people to cut off their beards and pay taxes to have windows and all this crazy stuff. And then in Prussia with a P, uh, Frederick the Great is going to take control of tax collection and he is going to require the nobility to serve him for certain amounts of times under penalty of death. On the other side is constitutionalism, which you can best see in England. In a constitutional monarchy, the, the king or the queen has to share power with some sort of parliamentary body. In England's case, you've got the monarch and you've got parliament. Now today, Queen Elizabeth II is mostly a figurehead. She lets parliament do most of the work. But in reality, there's a lot of power the queen does not use that she could. Now, that power is limited because the previous monarchs gave up their absolute power. Now, what I mean by that is the English parliament controls the army. The English parliament controls the economy. The English parliament controls tax collection. That didn't happen in the absolute monarchies. In the absolute monarchy, the kings had control of the economy. The kings had control of tax collection. But in a constitutional monarchy, that goes to the parliamentary body. Another thing about a constitutional monarchy is that personal liberties, civil liberties were guaranteed. Like for instance, in England, there's the right to fair taxation, free elections, a trial of your peers, a right to petition the government, and government officials could stay in power even if they disagreed with the monarch, which could not happen under Louis XIV. Now, there is a lot more to absolutism. There's a lot more to constitutionalism. There's a lot more to the 
wars of religion, but I only have so much time to keep your attention, and I don't want you to tune out. 35 minutes is probably your limit. Now for this week, if you're not aware, you do have a discussion and you do have a quiz. So you do have two things to do this week. You have a discussion and you have a quiz. Your discussion, let me go to lesson two real quick, is over this primary source reading. Oh, I went to the wrong lesson three. Sorry about that. Your lesson three, there are two readings. There's the 95 Theses by Martin Luther, and then there's the Address to the Christian Nobility of the German Nation, also by Martin Luther, also known as the Three Walls of the Romanist. Uh, what are you going to be reading for these? The 95 Theses, I want you to get an idea of what problems Martin Luther had with the church. And in an Address to the Christian Nobility, I want you to get a feeling, an idea of what problems Martin Luther had with the Pope himself. All right, <clears throat> that is plenty of stuff. You're probably tired of hearing me talk. I'm now at 36 minutes and 30 seconds. So I'll stop at this point. If you have any questions, if you have any concerns, if there's anything you'd like to know more about, reach out to me, email me. I love this period of history. I'll be glad to help you out if I can. But until next time, we'll see you later. Bye.